The Visayan region of the Philippines is a collection of large to small islands that spread across the open water of this tropical country. Most tourist places here are beach team resorts and re restaurants which is an excellent location for spending time to relax during the summer vacation. If you visit the municipality of Paribol in the island of Bohol and travel to the western tip of the town's territory, you will see a triangle-like towering structure. As you observe it, you see that it's a two-level building with a large triangle base and a circular structure with a roof on top. Looking closely to the open doorway of the structure, you see a short Spanish inscription and after translating it, it reads, Castillo de San Vicente Ferreira, in this Punta de la Cruz, whose title and tree of the Holy Cross have been venerated since the time of the Spanish conquest. Until today, in this town of Maripojo, with devotions to the station of the Holy Cross, 1796. If you haven't guessed it yet, this structure is known as Fort San Vicente, or its more common name, the Punta de la Cruz Watchtower, which are old relics of the past during the Spanish colonialism and during its piracy. Piracy in the Southeast Asia has been happening even before the arrival of the Europeans. Here in the Philippines, most pirates were of Moro origin and had their own base settlements located at the south of Mindanao and at the Sulu Archipelago. Moro pirate activity was concentrated on raiding expedition wherein they would attack and pillage coastal villages in the Philippines. Most of these which are located in Usayan regions and even reaching the islands in northern Luzon. One of the things these mortal pirates sought after in, this, in the raids were captains that they could sell as slaves in the small market. Their raids have caused great fear among the natives and traders of the Philippines as they bring devastating havoc on the daily lives of the people living in these villages and disrupting the coastal trade especially in Manila. A 1787 account by French navigator Jean-François de Gaulle Comte de la Cruz when he visited the almost destroyed village of Marinas and the South at the mouth of Manila Bay which was able to defend against the Moro pirate attacks of 1774 and 1780. The account goes Towards noon, I went on shore to the village. In front of the principal street, there is a large edifice of hewn stone but almost totally in ruins. They informed us that it was the habitation of the curate, the church, and the fort. But all these titles had overawed the moors of the islands of the south. They burned the village and destroyed the parson's house during the 1780 attack, making slaves of the Indians who couldn't save themselves and retiring with their captives back to the sea without molestation. The inhabitants of the colony had been terrified by the event. They are afraid to exercise their industry any longer. The lands are almost overgrown with weeds, and the parish so poor that we could purchase no more than a dozen fowls and a small hog. From 1768 to 1800, the Moro pirates will use the islands around southern Luzon as a large network of bases. These islands include the, that of Burias, Masbate, Capul, and Cantanduanes. They will usually launch with a fleet of 40 to 50 brahus and will carry a complement of 2,500 to 3,000 men supplemented with an assortment of arms and carried heavy artillery. With this force, they will be successful in their mass attacks and were able to destroy many coastal towns and villages. Some of these villages include Pirac in 1755, Kinyagan in 1767, Mahobap in 1781, Obion in 1793, Baler, Casiguran, and Palenan in 1798 were reduced to ashes. The Spanish government in the Philippines made efforts to capture and seize the piracy, especially in Visayas, where most of their raids occurred. Though the numerous streets between the islands had ship traffic flowing down, down them, the Spanish naval patrol could cover all of the areas where the pirates would travel. It was also due to the poor communication lines and the distance of the space caused strain and limits to the information gathered by the government. 
causing a slow response time to help to win coastal villages. At this time, the financial burden upwind of men, supply, and forts were draining the treasury of the Spanish government to the point that they started soliciting funds from religious sources, private companies, or wealthy people. Due to this problem, they decided to go instead into a defensive war wherein from 1778 to 1793, they invested 1.5 million pesos on armed vintas and cannon launches. Yet, only little were given to the importance of village defense. Also, the order was sent out to al Qaeda mayors and military governors that they will provide the men and maintenance of these ships with their own discretion and money, which in turn the government hoped that they would wounded expend more funds than necessary. Unfortunately, this program would collapse as most villages were able to raise sufficient funds, and the Pintas had a major, major drawback of able to sail only on certain times of the year for good weather. In 1794, leading military and civilian, civilian officials replaced the Pintas with division of followers and lanchas, which were armed with 18 to 24 pounder swivel guns, either placed on the boat or at the quarters. Yet they will be proven inadequate and they were too slow compared to the better prahus of the Moros. Another reason is that the crew weren't properly, tra properly trained and were led by poor officers. In 1826, an example of the failure of these fleets was an account by the Augustinian provincial Gregorio Rodriguez to the governor general who was asking if additional ships was suffice to the defense of Panay and Calamines. The account goes. The general opinion in Iloilo is that the launchers ordinarily cause more harm than good. In nine years of residency in Panay, I cannot remember ever hearing of the launchers having been victorious. They haven't seized a single Ponco or a single Muslim, nor have they been able to prevent them from coming and going with impunity. And despite all the divisions of launchers and faluas that presently exist, the Muslims have the audacity to pass right in front of Corregidor under the governor's very nose. And it's only after the Poncos have gone that the launches set out in pursuit. It is as though you were sending a tortoise to catch a deer. Due to the lack of support from the government, a few friars began to defend their own villages. A famous friar who would contribute to the establishment of defenses was Julian Bermejo, who was the friar of Waljaon in southern Cebu from 1804 to 1836. He constructed most of the Bolvar test and bulwarks in Cebu, which rest from Karkara to Santander. They were used to sight any approaching pirate squadrons and immediately send their reports from tower to tower, and they were also used to signal the nearby islands of Bohol, Negros, and Sikihol. Signaling devices would include the use of flags, bonfires, or bells. They would also organize the construction of ten Balaay clan, which are large boats from the towns of Argao, Dalagete, and Simbuga as part of a coastal patrol fleet. Very soon become mili became military commanders that defended their own villages and congregation from the war of pirates. In this part of the video, we will now discuss how the Baluerte or watchtower was used during a building bridge done by the Moros. The Baluartes were an integral part in the system of defenses as they served as communication outposts and important strongholds in coastal villages. They can be either made from wood or stone and constructed in different shapes as we can see from the present towers that are still standing today. They were mostly surrounded by trenches and palisades or stakes as an extra defense if the Moro pirates decided to attack the Baluarte. A common strategy for defending a village was when a signal was given either with light or sound devices, the women, children, and non combatants of the village would immediately retreat to the elevated terrain or hide in the thick forest of the island. Meanwhile, the men and friar would man the Baluarte and even the church walls which acted as strongholds when the Moro pirates would attack. This stronghold's purpose was to drive away or delay the invaders until a coastal patrol of allied ships would relieve and drive the Moro pirates away. The native Filipinos was an important resource for this coastal defense as they acted as the manpower behind the anti-piracy force and helped in maintaining the Baluarte when the defenses are destroyed 
by nationalist masters or by the more problem faced by the friars was that of the supply of weapons and ammunition. Though they were able to purchase sufficient number of guns, bladed weapons, and cannons, most of the gunpowder they purchased were either poor quality or sold in high prices with little to gain. A reason for this is because of government officials who were selling them the idea of, na of the native population having accent and use of the advanced weapons, and if the defense of a coastal village failed, it could lead to the loss of the equipment. In 1790s, the Manila government policy will change and they will begin handing out military equipment and entrusting the distribution of such arms to the Alcada mayors. By 1800-1830, 1,500 cannons have been distributed in many coastal settlements of the Philippines. Yet due to some Alcadas in Negros and Panay selling the arms and munitions to the Iranun and Saman who were part of the group of Moro pirates, the Spanish government began recalling the distribution of the weapons in fear that a national revolution may start by the native Filipinos. The rating would continue on for another 20 years with the newspaper La Politica stating that the Philippines have been defending their hometowns with sharpened sticks and stones until the late 1864. Thank you for watching the video. Please like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next video.